try to develop an imagination about what does that look like for us now in art, but also as a way of supporting what's actually happening in the elemental world throughout the cycle of the year. So I laid it out this way because this is the way she shows it. These signs that are going up are the ascending signs, and then so we're reaching up towards summer solstice, and then coming back at autumn equinox, going into the earth, and coming back up. So it's this cycle. And then my next slide shows you the ascending <laughs> signs. All right, so the first image there on the left-hand side represents Aries. And then the next image going from left to right, it's Taurus, then Gemini, then Cancer, Leo, Virgo, and Libra. These are what are referred to as the ascending signs of the zodiac, or the day signs, or the way Rudolf Steiner describes it is that the forces of the zodiac don't stream toward us in the same way. What's happening is the forces coming toward the human being on the earth from the zodiac are transformed by the activity of the human being and then lifted up again. And in our time, and this might sound way out there, but we'll save time for question and answer later. In our time, there are seven of the 12 signs of the zodiac that have already been ascended. And they belong to these seven signs right here. <coughs> Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, the hip. So if you imagine it in its relationship to the human form, with Libra being the hip region or the point of balance from here upward, the human being is free and oriented up. But then beginning with the region of Scorpio, the reproduction in the human being, Sagittarius the thigh, Capricorn the knee, Aquarius the shin, and Pisces the feet, we're still earthbound and descending. So this is the up, and then these signs represent this descent. So it's not, though, as I said earlier, that the stars are sending their influence toward us from outside, and moving us around on the earth and giving us uprightness, but that we bear this within us. So I'm going to share a bit of an esoteric picture, but just so that you understand where I'm coming from in describing that, it's not meant to try to indoctrinate anybody into my belief, but to share some of what motivates this idea. And the idea is kind of a, an awesome one, at least when I was exposed to it, which is that each one of us comes from a particular star. That's a huge idea. And when I read that, I thought, okay, which one? <laughs> How do you find that out? Where do you go read about it? Who can tell you? And it leads you on an amazing journey. I haven't found it yet, but I think I've gotten close to the vicinity of it, but then I get sent in another direction. And it's not just confined to the stars of the zodiac. There are billions of stars. There are billions of people on the earth right now, each one of us coming from a particular star. And that when the decision is made by who and what we are, when we're in the vicinity of that star, I will call it a soul spiritual being, to take up earthly incarnation, a process begins whereby we start this kind of traveling through the starry world, and then moving through the rhythms of the planets, coming to the guardian of the earth, which is the moon, just orbiting around the earth and waiting for the right moment to descend. So as the soul spiritual being, and moving through the starry world, moving through the rhythms of the planets, coming to the moon sphere, and gathering the forces that will then form, there's Jesse, <laughs> form this body that will be the home for this spirit germ that I'm cultivating. There's a very important point in this process where the soul spiritual being that is coming from its star toward physical incarnation on the earth, where this spirit germ that's being cultivated slips out of the hands of the soul into the physical world, into the space that is created in the woman's body through the intercourse. The intercourse opens something in the physical world so that that spirit germ may enter in. It's 
like a seed. Like a seed that has all the potential to become, you know, an acorn that can become an oak tree. This seed has within it the capacity to become this human being. Not because it's been separated now from that cosmic spiritual world that it came from, but because it's got those forces contained within it, and now it begins to weave out of the material of the physical world where it finds itself inhabited. But there's a very, very important thing happening at that moment. The soul, at least as it's described through astrosophy, the star wisdom that comes out of anthroposophy, is that the soul didn't just come with it at that moment. The soul is still in the moon sphere, gathering the cosmic gesture from the planets as they're moving with the stars and informing that seed, but it has an incredible longing to reunite with that seed. That longing is what gives it the strength to build up this body that can then receive all of the remaining parts, the soul. So the longing is something that's really, really important in our culture. We are overlooking the role of longing in many, many ways. We want an immediate return. But longing gives us strength. It kind of guides us to where we are going. And so the soul's longing for reunion with that spirit germ that it has been cultivated through this celestial cosmos is what gives the forces that then impart life to this physical substance. And then from within myself, I unfold these forces that I brought with me. So it's not that star sending a physical ray of light down toward me that's moving me around the earth and having an influence. It's the environment that I find myself in that allows or disallows me to unfold that star here from within myself and out. Now this is a changed relationship between human being and starry world. So this is where we get into kind of the history of the human being's relationship from astrology to astronomy to astrosophy. Astrology, the astrologos, is the speaking of the stars to the human being. So a period of time in the course of human history when there was a greater relationship to that world from which one was coming <coughs> rather than the world which we are inhabiting now, the consciousness was more attuned to that rhythm, living within that rhythm. And that then, in the course of human history, there comes the point at which this knowledge is being lost and the focus is on the physical environment that we're ha inhabiting. And this starts around the 1500s with the idea that Nicholas Copernicus introduces, which is that the Earth is not at the center of our system, but that it, with all of the other planets, is orbiting the sun. Now prior to Nicholas Copernicus and this idea, it was not so much a question of what's physically at the center. It wasn't about the physical. It was this relationship to a living spiritual cosmos and the belief that the human being was central to the attention of a living cosmos. The cosmos was inhabited by beings that are interested in what's going on on the earth. But then comes the necessity for the human being to focus just on this world and the awareness of the living spiritual nature of the celestial cosmos goes to sleep. And then we have the beginning of what we call astronomy, which is the body of knowledge about this environment that we find ourselves in, astronomy, looking at now how far away is that star or that planet? What is the chemical composition of the atmosphere? of that body. Now we're thinking in time and space, laws of the physical world, to try to understand this environment that we're in. It's no longer acceptable to talk about Jupiter or Zeus as a god that's sending an influence our way. Galileo uses his telescope to look into the night sky and to see that Jupiter is not this great wielder of thunderbolts sitting on a mighty throne. It's a big ball of gas with moons going around it. This totally shifts the consciousness, and it's really unsettling. John Donne, on the first anniversary of Galileo's discovery, wrote a poem called First Anniversary. And he really, in a, in a poetic way, describes how unsettling it is, this idea that the Earth is not at the center 
and that the celestial cosmos is not populated by beings that are interested in what's happening with the human being on the earth. And he says in this poem, new philosophy. This new philosophy is this heliocentrism. Earth is not at the center, the sun is, we're going around it. These are big balls of rock and gas and ice and it totally removes the mystery of and the poetry of that world. He says, and new philosophy calls in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out. The sun is lost and the earth and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. For freely men confess that this world spent when in the planets and the firmament they seek so many new, they see that this is crumbled out to its atomies. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone, all just supply and all relation are things forgot. Prince, subject, father, son are things forgot. For every man alone thinks he must be a phoenix, and none can be of that kind of which he is but he. And what he's expressing there is this idea that if we've been cast out of the center, we better take care of ourselves and ourselves alone. So no sense thinking about my community because I gotta protect me and mine because there's nothing protecting me. There's no theory of gravitational force yet. What's holding me on this earth if it's moving like that? So there's this kind of fear factor that's entering in. It's very uh, unsettling. We take it for granted right now that the earth beneath our feet is moving, but we still give the verb of motion to the sun. We say, let's go watch the sun set. We don't say, let's go watch the earth turn east. <laughs> so it, but it's a real thing that we do. We accept this abstraction every single day. And then we say, but yeah, but we know it's moving. We accept that it's moving. And maybe it is moving. And I've been talking about all of it moving. But it's something that we have to kind of take ourselves to task with this idea that, okay, there were minds thinking about this and trying to figure out how to explain what we're seeing. Right now, the, the astronomical community talks about black holes. And they say there's a black hole not only in a few places, but at the center of every galaxy. And we know now that there are lots of galaxies in our universe. And there's a black hole at the center of every one. Now, we've never seen one but it describes a lot of the things that we're seeing happen. <coughs> so it can't just be accepted that black holes are a reality, but we're using it as a mechanism right now for describing the environment that we're in. So it's important to remember that so that we can have a real relationship to the earth beneath our feet and the stars overhead. In the work that I do in northern Michigan, I'm fond of saying, all right, if you're just a regular human being endowed with normal, healthy capacities and you go outside at night, you can see between seven and 10,000 objects in the night sky. With the use of telescopes, satellites, computers to collate the data, we can now identify over 900 million objects. The jump from 10,000 to 900 million, that's a huge number. But that jump has not been a jump in consciousness. And if you don't have access to a deep space telescope, you're not seeing any of that stuff. And there's one community that pretty much has a monopoly on what it is that is being seen. And it's a scientific community, <coughs> and there's a very specific language used to describe what that is. In my world, without trying to offend the scientists, what we're being told, these are, the scientists are the storytellers. This is our contemporary mythology. Future generations will look back and say, look what they believed in. Like we look back and see, they used to believe in dragons. They used to have these stories, like Cetus the whale, this mighty constellation, was this monster that was born out of this black roiling sea. He was coming to devour the Andro Andromeda, who's chained to a rock. We see the exact same thing. Our galaxy is gonna smash into Andromeda. We haven't changed that much. There's a black hole at the center of our galaxy. Monsters that devour things. There's this similarity, but we use different terms now that we consider really scientific and sometimes sophisticated, and I don't mean to offend the science, because it's really important in our striving as we seek to understand this environment that we're in. But for a certain period of time, we've shut off this relationship to the cosmos as though it were a living, spiritual thing, and are just looking at it according to the laws of physicality, and we've imposed something called celestial mechanics.